Hi, Alexander. Hey, everyone. Just wait a bit for a few more to come in. Oh, lots of happy waving. That's fantastic. Excellent. Thank you. Look, everyone's Did you say everyone? Hi. <laughs> Hi. Now, we've got oh, all these people flooding in. That's fantastic. Good. Good. We'll just give it one or two more seconds. Um, I might just share the screen while I'm waiting. There you go. Oops. What happened there? Running. Why can't I see the actual? I can see the participants. I just can't see the screen. How strange. I stop sharing. Oh, it's a good one. Stop sharing. Very strange. Um, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I've got on speaker view. That's perfect. Uh, <clears throat> so tonight, great news. Uh, uh, so uh, first of all, welcome to week eight, the second lecture, um, the last lecture. And today we're going to be talking about OPSEC, which is fantastic. Um, and I'm really pleased that Brendan Hopper is going to come and talk to us. That's always a treat. And it's quite hard to get him. So we were very lucky this year. Um, and we're also going to go over some of the topics we've been talk talked about at the end of last week, uh, last lecture, and some of the puzzles as well um, about the fair, twine co <laughs> fair coin toss. But without further ado, let's just jump in and start. And we'll talk about the job application as well. Uh, and we'll talk about all the extension material. And Lachlan's been putting that up. And you should be able to access the extension videos now and um, some exercises as well to practice on. And we'll have more of them coming up as well. So that's good. I'm sorry there's been a pause on those. Um, and even if you don't get to it all before the end of the course, I hope um, that you continue to uh, study and read and learn from them, benefit from them even after the course, because there's a wealth of stuff um, there that's really nice when you're getting started. Okay, now Brendan's going to be joining us at quarter past seven. I can see it's about five past. Sorry, he's going to join us at quarter past five, and it's five past five now. So we've got about 10 minutes. All right, let's start on those puzzles that we finished the last lecture on. So coin toss. First of all, I've seen some good posts about coin, fair coin toss tosses, one really big one on the homepage, and lots of individual people have been thinking about it. Um, so the, the problem, again, just to remind you, is suppose we've only got telephone, though in a second we'll widen that and you'll see it won't actually make any difference if we also have video. Um, so you, suppose you've only got telephone and you have to toss a coin with someone unseen and both of you have to be happy that the outcome of the coin toss was fair. So if they're doing it at their end and telling you what the coin toss was, you, you can't think they're trying to trick you. And if you get to have control of the coin and tell them, they can somehow feel that it really was fair. Um, and that means you're telling them what was on the coin and you used an appropriate coin. It was a 50-50 coin and you didn't toss it six times and pick the one you liked or anything like that. They've somehow got to be able to tell all of that, but they can't see any of it at all. All they've got is this phone line with you and they can't even hear what's going on. They can just hear you at the end giving them some information. Which is head. They just say head or tails, that's not enough. So we've got to give them a bit more information. So the question is now, it becomes an information theory question, how much and what sort of information do we need to give them? How much is necessary for them to believe that it was a fair coin toss? Um, that's a really interesting problem. And you might almost think it's impossible. Does anyone want to say um, what the characteristic of a, a good solution would be? Does anyone have any thoughts about what of convincing someone that it was fair might look like? Um, I have actually thought of a solution to that. Yeah, so do, do you want me to mention that? I'm, I'm not 100% sure if, if it's actually like tossing the coin is required or not. I was thinking about a fair way to get like uh, the result of coin toss. Yeah. 
Uh, huh? do you do, uh, would you like to participate? Yes, I would. Let's do it together. Okay. okay. So, uh, so first thing, um, I've got this in like three steps. Yeah. So first step would be um, you and I agreeing on a sequence of numbers, sequence of letters, which right. is a combination of head and tail. Uh, let's say the sequence is uh, head, head, H, H, T, H, T, T, and H, T. Uh, I'll say that again more slowly. Should I write it down? Uh, I'll just type it in the chat. Um, so it, it's just like uh, uh, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and 0, 0. Like uh, 1, 1. H, H, T, 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 H, yep. and T, T, H, T. So this is a combination of eight, yep. a sequence of eight letters, which is H means head, T means tail. Uh, I think it's pretty clear. So what? Um, so both of us would be looking on the same sequence of letters. And now the second is we agree on a choice. So what do you, what do you choose, head or tail? I choose head. Head. Okay, I'm gonna choose tail. It always wins. <laughs> Not sure the. So uh, so now what we have to do is uh, we have to select a number between one and four. Yeah. like uh, out of one, two, three, four, any any of those numbers, just select any one. On account of uh, three, like I, I'll say three, two, one, go. <gasps> and then and then you're gonna have to choose a number uh, that would be arranged between one and four. Okay. Okay, so uh, are, you, are you ready? I am. Okay, so three, two, one, go. Three. three. How much did you say, three? Okay, so you said three, I said three, right? Cool, pretty sure. <laughs> Is anyone listening? I did sound a lot. <laughs> okay, yeah, anyway, go. go. Anyway, so uh, uh, did you say three or four? Let, um, I, I actually really did say three. Okay, so you said three, right? So what we do is we add up the numbers. So uh, three and three become six. Now count. Uh, now find the number take in the position of yes in the sixth position yes you win if i had said four out of one curses i was just a bit too slow sorry uh you won i think yeah yeah i did if i had managed to say four i would have won <laughs> so i think uh i'm not sure if, if this actually uh is actually what you wanted but i think this does like a fair way of yeah giving us the results. That's really clever. That's really clever. Uh, now let's think what characteristics it has. Um, I think there's this assumption of simultaneity in there. If we can do something simultaneously, so it's a bit like paper, scissors, rock. Yeah. Uh, somehow we both reveal what we're doing at the same time as the other one reveals what they're doing. And there's no lag between them. So I can't adjust, although I can try, yeah. what I'm doing uh, once I learn what you're doing. Yeah. So, and yeah, in the beginning, I thought about like doing one thing at a time, like if Alice and Bob are the two participants and Alice does one thing, like create something and then Bob does the other, like makes the choice and things like that. But it actually doesn't work once, once a person finds out both of the information, uh, the other party might, just like you try to change oh, yeah. the number, might, might want to do that. That's a really good observation. So I'm just looking at some of the comments that people are, are saying, and they're really good. Um, so yeah, if we have to serialize it, it becomes a bit of a problem. But if we don't serialize it, then the simultaneity thing is quite nice. The idea that we can both say something and we can't take it back after we've said it, um, but we don't get to hear what the other one's saying before we commit to what we're saying. That's very nice. Um, Someone saying, could we just say heads and tails instead of and make it simpler? And I guess we could, couldn't we? We could do it so that we both either say heads or tail, and if they're both the same, I win, and if they're both different, you win, or something like that. That that would work too. That's probably a bit simpler. Um, There's but, some pretty wild um, psychological games you can play when you have to be simultaneous and you know, like the outcomes in you know, in advance or something. Uh, so if you did this in a different order, yes. then like I guess I guess what I'm saying is. There's some patterns that people do. They'll say heads, and then they'll say heads, and they'll say tails, and they'll say heads. Oh, okay. Right? 
like and if you, you yeah. it's kind of well known that there's a pattern that people use or there's a couple of patterns yeah, yeah. so you can abuse this a little bit thank you oliver um actually i am very good at knowing these patterns and i um i am a pretty damn good scissor paper rocker and scissor paper rock is very similar to this very clever idea um so let's try scissor papers rock uh is there someone who wants to volunteer to play scissor paper rock with me maybe i'll do it all right thank you um all right uh so we'll both call them out at the same time uh, we'll do this simultaneity thing what do you think i'm just going to make your face really big so i can read your impression can someone say one two three and on three we both call it out one two three scissors, scissors. Woohoo! Yeah. Okay. I know what you're going to say next. Let's try it again. Uh, call out again. Tom, are you the caller? -er? Yes, I was. Yep. One, two, three. Paper. Paper. <laughs> okay. But you got to stay looking at the camera. Don't look away because uh, it's harder to do it when you look away. Um, all right. Again, let's do three in quick succession now. Uh, so just go uh, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and we'll call it out again. One, two, three. Rock. rock. One, two, three. Rock. rock. One, two, three. Paper. Paper. <laughs> so good. All right. Um, we can I, you're really good at this. You want to try one more? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> one, Hang two. On. No, no, no. What did you say last? What did you say last? Paper? Someone back me up on that? Yeah. Yeah, I think it was paper. Okay, this is a bit hard then. It's hard to follow, but I think I've got it. Okay. One, two, three. Rock. Rock. I don't want to play anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's really good. So um, we'll talk a bit more about this after Brendan's come because he might actually already be here. Brendan, are you here? Yes, I am. Ah, would you like to give your um, talk on optics? Uh, yeah, that would be great. Can I just introduce you to everyone? Yep. Oh, and I'll put the slides up too. Um, let me just share the screen. Um, I loaded your slides up. Sorry. Sorry, can everyone just say, someone speak out loud, just let me know if you can see. Yeah, we can. Yep. Okay, all right. Yep, can see it. All right, Brendan, uh, everyone, <laughs> uh, a remarkable man who's talking about what I know, approach to life and to security. Um, there's a bit of noise there, it might be from Brendan, but if it's from someone else, if you could just turn to um, uh, And I always interested and surprised when Brendan talks. And if you were at the SecEdu Summit last year when we were talking about the future and what cyber might be like in the future, um, <laughs> Brendan, Brendan gave a talk that pretty much for the first 10 minutes of it, I thought he'd gone insane and was on drugs. And then for the last 10 minutes of it, I thought it was pretty much the cleverest thing I'd ever heard. So uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing tonight. So Brendan, please, off you go. Thanks, Richard. Um, and I'd like to remind everyone that those things aren't mutually exclusive. Um, <laughs> All right, so um, I, I'm going to talk to, today about OPSEC. Um, and Richard, I might just get you to go along to the first slide. Yep. Um, so OPSEC is uh, operational security. And basically, OPSEC is the type of security that you need to implement um, around how you run your operations. And typically, particularly in cybersecurity, with hackers, with governments who are doing things like hacking, um, cyber espionage, all those kinds of things. OPSEC specifically refers to the steps that people take to not get caught. Um, and it's important to remember there's no, you can't say the attackers are the bad guys, they're hackers and the defenders are the good guys. And you can't say the opposite because really, in a lot of situations, sometimes, you know, the government may sanction some sort of cyber 
activity or cyber operation and in, in from a certain perspective to some people in that instance they're the good guys in other instances in that exact same situation they're the bad guys because they're adversaries um so it's really important to remember that i'm not going to apply any judgment because you can't say attackers are bad or good or defenders are bad or good um a lot of this is going to be taken from how operational security or OPSEC evolved more on the hacker side of things and what hackers do uh, to not get caught. And probably more importantly, the mistakes that hackers make that lead them to getting caught and arrested, and prosecuted, etc. cetera. Um, but at the same time, it does include some thinking from the other side of things, how governments and enterprises that do this kind of thing legitimately, what they do to avoid detection. And more and more, those two things are blurring together. Um, and I think OPSEC really starts in the same place that most conflict starts in terms of how you think about a contest or you think about a conflict is in order to succeed, you have to have a good understanding of what your strategy is. And that comes down to realistically what Sun Tzu said about knowing your enemy and knowing yourself. And when you're thinking, say you're going to undertake a cyber operation, whether that's to attack someone or whether that's actually to try to protect someone who is attacking, um, it starts with understanding who your adversaries are and what you're trying to protect. And you should really think about this with the lens of a normal threat modeling exercise, just the same way as you pick up an iPad and say, how do I break into this iPad or how do I make this iPad secure? You should do the same thing around your processes. If you want to understand your own OPSEC or if you want to understand someone else's to try to defeat it, it really goes through a normal threat modeling process, which is essentially, you know, thinking about what are your secrets, thinking about where your secrets are, thinking about what you're trying to achieve and really as well, thinking about who's trying to stop you or who's trying to detect you or who, who's trying to evade your detection. And when you think about all the various adversaries out there, it's easy to fall into a trap and most people would naively just assume that they're on a, an increasing curve of sophistication where if you think about the people who are the best at detecting it, hackers or getting away with hacking things without being detected uh, without being detected like the nsa are superior in most ways to everyone else along that chain right so the nsa are better than the fbi who are better than the state police but that's actually not true and some technologies and some things you can do to protect you from being discovered by spy agencies in the nsa aren't actually really effective if that's not who your adversary are and your adversary is really the local police or the adversary is your parents or something like that. And it's worthwhile just doing a little bit of a mental exercise to actually think about how you would keep a secret from the NSA versus how you'd keep a secret from say your parents, right? So, and while the NSA has trillions of dollars worth of spy equipment, my mum can probably tell you I'm lying quicker than they can. So it's really important to keep in mind this, like all kinds of conflict, is really about understanding what your adversaries are capable of doing and what they actually are able to put into practice. All right, thanks. So I'll jump straight into tools and I will, I'll just run through the content and then I will um, take questions at the end. But essentially, I'm not gonna go too much into tools because People who are using tools to remain anonymous, like VPNs and Tor, and I will talk about those two. Realistically, if someone's going to, I'm going to, you know, someone's going to do some hacking using Tor or a VPN, understanding how that tool works is really, really important to them being able to use it in a way where they can actually guarantee they're going to use it properly and not going to be detected. And lots of people have been caught because they've, jumped in too quickly and started using tools like Tor or VPN and haven't understood how they work, what they do, what they don't do, what their weaknesses are. Um, so, but the, the, the two basic tools I will explain is VPNs. So VPNs are probably everyone knows in this day and age, but 
virtual private networks, you pay some company $10 a month maybe, and you connect to the internet via their servers. So instead of appearing coming from your home address or your Wi-Fi, you're coming from some server. That could be Russia, Norway, somewhere else in Australia, whatever. Um, the other end of the spectrum in terms of VPNs are very much concentrating all your access into one place and trying to remain anonymous almost by mixing your traffic with lots of other bad traffic because if you're using a VPN to download movies and lots of other people are using VPNs to download movies, it becomes very hard to say who was actually doing what unless you're the VPN company. Tor is different. Tor is the onion router. It's essentially an anonymizing protocol or software that routes your traffic through a network that makes it very hard to see where the original source is. Um, now, I think what's important here is lots of people have been caught, lots of people have gone to jail because they've been caught as a result of misunderstanding these two pieces of software or these two technologies and what they really are. And VPNs in the industry, they're actually primarily a policing tool. So every VPN provider that's ever been subpoenaed that I know of has given away full logs if they kept them um, to any law enforcement agency that's essentially of the same affiliation. So, you know, Western countries will give the logs across to other Western countries, et cetera. Um, they, they all comply and share those logs. That's best case. Worst case is the VPN companies are actually sometimes either ran or are originally started independently, but then they end up being part ran or orchestrated with the supervision of some sort of federal police or um, internet agency that's effectively using the VPN to really hone in on the shadiest traffic. And this is where it comes down to the adversary thing again, like understanding who you're trying to hide from. If you're sharing a VPN with 10,000 people and they're all torrenting, and you're downloading movies as well, you're probably not going to stand out and your information is probably not going to be the, the one that gets zoomed in on and investigated. But if everyone else is using that for downloading Disney movies and you're using it for hacking into government servers, you can bet that the people who are running that system, if asked to by the government, will share your information. But more than likely, the people running that system feed that information in fairly real time through to law enforcement for their analysis. And the, the, the people like the NSA and the, those high level spy agencies whose one of their missions is to monitor the internet, they have either legitimate or illegitimate ways into both of those networks. And realistically, you're concentrating your bad behavior somewhere that is easier for them to scrutinize. Um, Lots of hackers as well have gone to jail because they've done Tor and VPNs, but they've done them in the wrong order. So if you're connecting into a VPN via Tor and the VPN doesn't know who you are, that's some level of anonymous access. But if you're using a VPN to get to Tor, that's actually the worst of both worlds because you suffer the performance degradation of Tor, you're flagging yourself as being very dodgy, and there's an agency there, the VPN in the middle, who knows what you're doing and can essentially draw it everything that you're putting into Tor. Um, and, and real hackers have actually found themselves caught because of that. Um, all right, I might just move on from tools. Cool, so this is important. Um, good OPSEC is idiot proof. And the person who, when you're designing a good OPSEC protocol or a set of protocols, you need to think about the fact that at their worst, everyone makes mistakes. And lots of hackers, lots of actually government operations have been detected and caught because someone was tired, drunk, lazy. After months of not making any mistakes, they finally made one mistake. And you, you know, like any, any sport, you're playing video games, you're playing a sport, you make mistakes. Hacking computer activities, all those kind of things, they're exactly the same and mistakes happen. So good OPSEC methodologies fail closed. That means that computers are set up so that they can't possibly 
send traffic directly, they have to go via the anonymizing network. They can't possibly leak any information. There's mechanisms in place to detect what's actually going out, the, the connections, and really be able to step in and detect if you've made a mistake and prevent you from making that. I might just move on. Cool. So there's essentially the way I think around basic OPSEC protocols is there's four real layers of operational security, right? And hackers historically have really focused on the weakest of these two layers, three and four. Um, the first one, and this, this goes for government operations, this goes for cyber criminals, this goes for all kinds of covert behavior, whether online or not. The strongest layer of operational security is that no one knows that anything bad is happening, that they need to investigate. Then once that layer fails, because it's kind of like a, an onion, there's lots of layers that you don't want to just have one set of controls, you want defense in depth in operational security, just like you do with all other security. So the second layer is someone may find out that something has happened, but there's no idea who has done that or why they've done it. You don't understand the motivation. You don't understand who the threat actor is. The third level, once you know, you could investigate and you could actually find out, you could say, we know that this was a hacker group called Blah, or we know that this was some hackers in China, or we know this was some hackers in Australia that have done this thing, and we know that these are their active hours, and we think they did it for this reason but we can't actually tie them to their real world identities. We don't know who these people are. Anything more fine grained than the nation level or the geographical level, right? So, you know, there's a, we know that there was a hacker who did this called Bartman, but we've got no idea who that person is. Um, and then the final layer of operational security is once someone understands, can, can go all the way down the chain, we understand that there's a cyber incident that needs to be investigated. We've in investigated. We know it was done by this particular person and we think that person is, say, Richard. How can we prove it was Richard? And what are the evidence that we can collect on that fact? And Richard, with good operational security, wants to make sure that there is no evidence. All right, I'll just move on and I'll, I'll go a little bit deeper into each of those layers. So, definitely this first layer of operational security, the fact that no one knows that anything is happening and no one is investigating, this is the strongest level of defense. And lots of hackers and attackers, they'll break into networks and historically, there's this concept in hacking called persistence, which basically means you install malware, you install rootkits, so that you can always get back into the environment. Um, Most of the time, that level of persistence isn't actually required for a cyber operation. So if you've given a particular mission, whether that's in government or whether that's a social hacktivism thing or whether that's uh, any kind of operation, by default, people always assume they're going to need to get back in. But often it's easier to break in again than it is to evade detection if you don't modify anything and if you're not installing anything installing any malware so that you can get back in you're actually drastically reducing the chances that anyone's going to investigate in the first place um, similarly lots of hackers get caught and actually some government ops have been foiled this way too um, because people brag to their partners and friends they tell their girlfriends or their boyfriends that they hacked into something they tell their friends that they did something that then escapes because you know the thing about secrets is if you tell two people those two people will tell two people and then you've got an exponential runaway sort of thing um so definitely one of the key things for good operational security is not to tell people that this is happening um along a similar track hackers are starting to discover that various industries have enforced how long they'll keep evidence on hand to be able to investigate hacking so uh, people who process credit cards, their, their systems are required to comply with something called the PCI DSS standard, 
which says all logs have to be retained for 12 months, which means that all those systems, if they're compliant, there's going to be 12 months of logs where someone who's an incident specialist or the police could go in and investigate. So hackers are actually starting to understand that and wait. So if you wait 16 months because logs are very expensive, there's a lot less chance that anyone's actually going to be able to investigate when you start selling your data. And if you say you've stolen a bunch of credit cards, you might have stolen a million credit cards from a database. You can't actually sell a million credit cards anyway because no, there's no market for a million credit cards. And in a year, maybe half of them will be expired. But actually, you're probably better off if you, if you think through that from the attacker's perspective. You're probably better off waiting a year and making sure there's no data to be able to investigate and then have a 50% hit rate and basically half the cards work, half of them don't. Now, this is interesting. So social hacktivists are, like what I mean by social hacktivists, these are people who hack to steal information or to reveal information and then to make it public. So Edward Snowden stole a bunch of data as a contractor from the NSA about spy programs, revealed that publicly. Now, very clearly, Edward Snowden made a conscious decision that he would take the social cost, which is essentially being declared a criminal in the US and having to live in places like Russia for the rest of his life if he doesn't want to go to jail at best, um, against the fact that the data should, in his opinion, be made public. And in a lot of situations, that's actually a proactive step out of the OPSEC thing where you say, all right, I've done this, I've done this thing and I've maintained my OPSEC up until this point so no one knows I've taken the data. But in order to be really impactful with this, I've decided to make it public and I've also decided to attach my name to it. But whenever you do that, it's really important to understand that whether it's right or wrong, the penalties that are applied for this kind of thing are always really extreme, particularly in the kind of military and defense and national secrets parts of the world. So the, just because you may think you're doing the right thing, it's not gonna give you any immunity to any of the legal consequences or the, the consequences to your freedom for these kind of things. And lots of hacktivists know that. Right, so um, essentially the next layer of the, the OPSEC onion is if people understand that there has been a compromise, some data has been stolen, how, do you, how, how does an attacker go about impeding the investigation of working out who or why they did it? And how do, how do the defenders go around working that out? So hackers do something called bouncing. And this is essentially if you want to get to a target, you're living in Australia and you want to compromise something in the US, you could go through a system that's in Russia and then it connects to a system that's in China and it connects to a system that's in Iran and then the system in Iran finally connects to your target. Versus you could connect first to the USA, then to Canada, then to France and then to the target. And it's important to think about this because if you were to put the hat on of the investigator, in order to backtrack this investigation, you went to the target, you say, okay, someone's broken into this from a server in France. I need to get that person in France to share with me and cooperate. And then you realize from that, their cooperation, then you need to go and get the cooperation of someone in Canada and et cetera and so on to the USA. That's probably going to be much easier to get the cooperation of those, of three companies or three countries like that than it is if the countries aren't necessarily on the best terms with each other. So if you go Russia, China, Iran, very hard if you're an Australian or an American company to get all three of the sets of those companies to cooperate in a reasonable time period. But there's a flip side to that as well, right? So think about how many people right now are trying to hack every internet connected system in Nigeria. And the answer here is a lot because it's perfect for things like this. It's perfect for bouncing. And there's almost no chance of the Nigerian government taking action against someone anywhere outside of Nigeria in the world for hacking into their computers. And lots of cyber criminal activities, some government sponsored activities have actually been foiled because they did this kind of bouncing thing and they assumed that what that they'd hacked into wasn't already hacked by someone else. 
And there's something else you should look up called honeypots if you don't know what they are, but essentially honeypots are systems that are intentionally put on the internet and vulnerable and designed to collect attacker techniques, tools, behavior, and to be able to analyze these kind of things. Cool. Uh, the final thing here is if you're sharing data, um, there's professional sanitization services for publishing data and being anonymous like WikiLeaks, but people use services like WikiLeaks as though they expect WikiLeaks themselves to preserve their anonymity. And I think it's important to really think about if you were in a hypothetical situation where you were going to give some secrets to WikiLeaks, would you need WikiLeaks to know who you really are? And are you really willing to transfer your trust in your object to them by sharing information about yourself? And this is a kind of common thing that, you know, when you think through these scenarios, it's often better not to let anyone know and to essentially pre-anonymize all your data, use a fake identity for sharing with things like this, just as you would if you were actually, you know, breaking into a system because things are traced not just via looking at the systems that may have been compromised, but they're also traced by looking at where the data surfaced. All right. Cool. So once an organization understands who a person is or, you know, we've had a system hacked by some famous hacker or some hacker that has a handle botnet, for example, who is that person? Um, lots of hackers historically have really overinvested in this step or really thought that this step was infallible. And persona management, the idea of maintaining lots of personas, having 10, 20, 30, 40 fake identities that are all separate fake people to gain access to things, to be able to participate in online gray markets and dark markets and online uh, underground sites and things like that without letting any of them get connected. That's actually become a really kind of like a sub industry of itself. There's a, if you want to learn more about that, it's called cyber Intel on the defensive side of things, cyber intelligence, but effectively maintaining personas is becoming a real art and craft that has a lot of, various things. I used to talk in this talk about what some of those are, but I think I'd probably say it's evolved so much over the past couple of years that you'd be better off just looking it up from people who doing do it as a dedicated thing. Um, I'd suggest you Google unmask.py. This was a Python script published by some people who started a hacking tools company called Immunity. And they were, some of them, a couple of them were ex-NSA and unmask.py is a very simple script and there's much more advanced ones that are used on both sides of the divide that essentially analyzes language and written posts and things like forums and correlates people together. Um, and by this I mean there's lots of quirks in human language you can tell by how people punctuate, how they use sentences, you know, the how you spell the word jail, whether you use serial commas, how you use smileys, what direction they run in, how you type an ellipsis, is it two dots, is it three dots, are there space between them, that reveal a huge amount of information about the origins of a person. So maintaining uh, personas often involves giving each of your personas language quirks if you're gonna be chatting in forums and then applying those quirks and once again, if we go back to the principle of things should be idiot proof, that should be done by programming, not by hand. Um, lots of people have been caught and lots of operations have been failed because people have used identities between two different situations. And if you think about a hacker group that has six people and another hacker group that has six people with one person in common, if you can link those two groups together, you haven't doubled the amount of information that you can investigate you've essentially you know taken it to a much greater level because you can then start understanding at a, a far more scales it's almost like a, a birthday attack it scales out exponentially um you should google someone called the gruck g-r-u-g-q um, he's probably the best person on opsec 
He talks a lot about how nation states and terrorists do OPSEC and how they're bad at it and how they could be better. Um, if, if you Google him, probably don't do it from a lab computer because he's not a very not safe for work. He's not a very safe for work person. Uh, but he has a, a quote which is, "You can be famous or you can be a hacker, but you can't be a famous hacker," and that's uh, fairly true. Cool. Last thing. Um, this is the, the the final thing is we know that the famous hacker Bartman was actually Richard and we're going to take some law enforcement activity against him. We're going to go to his house and we're going to seize his equipment. Um, can we get proof? This is massively overemphasized and it's the least effective layer of operational security. Um, some people in the 90s and even the 2000s, they were doing dumb things like booby trapping their computers. Someone put a nail bomb in the computer so when the police went to investigate, it exploded. That's an admission of guilt. So most modern courts will say if you do that, um, you're guilty anyway. At the same time, courts are increasingly being able to compel you to decrypt encrypted hard drives and computers. And if you don't decrypt them, they're finding people guilty. Um, there was a case a couple of years ago in Europe and Scandinavia where someone was convicted. End to end, everything they did was encrypted. The police couldn't seize any forensic evidence, but what they did do was they knew over a period of several months that the hacking of a bunch of Scandinavian government computers only ever happened when this person was home and using the wireless. And they were sitting outside their house, working out when they were using their Wi-Fi, and they basically said, you know, we've recorded... 50 accesses to this system over a period of six months and this has only happened when the person's home and using their wi-fi and it hasn't happened at any other time and that was enough to essentially convict them in a court i think in denmark i want to say um you could look that up it's logica cmg did the investigation uh so lots of this kind of trying to hide the evidence while it's a step it's the weakest step and shouldn't be relied on as much as possible. Um, all right, I will stop there and I might just flip over to questions. Are there a bunch in the chat? Um, let's have a look up at the chat up. But everyone, thank you very much, Brendan. That was fantastic. Can everyone just turn their mics on briefly and clap? Um, so, uh, uh, why don't people start asking audio questions while I try and work out how to get the chat questions up? Are we going to be able to access these later, these slides? Because there yeah, are I'm some names I didn't get to write down that I would like to Google. Yeah, these are fine to be shared. Okay. They're already in the notes. Um, I've got a quick question. Um, I had a quick look at unmask.py. I'm just reading through it. I, it seems like a really simple file and from my understanding, it just kind of cleans up a little bit of text. Can you please elaborate a little bit more about what the whole idea of unmask.py really helps you? So I think you might be accessing a version of unmask.py then that's gone up as a replacement for the original. The original one was just basic semantic analysis to try to group people into, um, try to group people into various regions and essentially work on a corpus of text and work out whether two people were the same. Okay, um, yeah. they, they, definitely they a may have uploaded, different file, yeah. yeah. They may have hidden it. I'll see if I can find it, and if so, I'll send it through to Richard to share with the class. Okay, thank you for that. Thanks. Can I ask about VPNs for a second? Sure. Um, if VPNs are so known for always being monitored by police and if, and if sort of any VPN could just give their records over, how come they're so popular these days and how come there's a whole industry around them and so many people rely on them? Uh, because it's, it's essentially, um, like I said, if a VPN, a big VPN might have 50,000 customers, right? Um, yeah. The five people who are doing really illegal things through it, whether that's 
hacking, child pornography, all those kind of things that governments actually care about, they're going to be definitely have the information revealed on that. I'd be surprised if you could find a commercial VPN that isn't actively looking for those two sets of activities and sharing it proactively with law enforcement. Okay. At, but all the people who are just using it to connect to torrents so you can get Game of Thrones a day early or I don't know what, it, what people are torrenting at the moment because Australian things don't have things on. But all, all, all the people who are doing the, the really low end things that you'd barely classify as crimes, that's essentially way below the threshold of what those people care about. Like, and if you put yourself in the shoes of maybe you're the FBI, you've infiltrated some VPN company, or you've actually set up a VPN company to do this kind of thing. You don't really want to be taking people to jail for Disney. You just want to weed out the 0.1% of hardcore criminals and you're happy to allow the rest to slide. All right. I see. Yeah. Can, can I also ask, is there an element of trying to keep a level of just uh, basic privacy from say your internet service provider? So if you want to be, uh, is it, is it true that if you use a VPN, your internet service provider doesn't have access to the information that's passing through it, but the VPN uh, provider still has access to what's going through it. Yeah, exactly. So the VPN provider still has the information. Although what the ISP loses is the ISP loses the information on who you're talking to because all they see is you talking to the VPN provider. What they don't lose is they don't lose how often you talk, what times of day you talk, some other characteristics like the size of your packets and your protocols and all that kind of thing. So like if you run a, if you're on a port scan through a VPN an ISP can still see that that looks very different from if you're using a web browser. Right. But they, so, yes, that's exactly right. So you can still have an element of, of personal privacy um, however, anything, uh, if this is still, uh, whatever you are doing is legal, you still have a level of personal privacy that's going on by using a VPN provider, which would mean there's still a, a big use and, and value to having a VPN provider as well. In some situations, right? Like it's, it's the exact same thing. Are you, are you worried about the NSA or your mum? Um, it's definitely much better at all the detections that your ISP are going to do. It prevents you against that kind of thing. Um, but if you were doing some serious crime, it probably puts you at higher risk of being detected than just letting your ISP because your ISP probably don't have the sophistication to be able to detect advanced attacks. Right. Whereas a VPN might. Right. Neil's got a question in the comments just um, quickly, but keep the audio one coming. Which is, could you give some specific examples of what you mean by making OPSEC? Uh, Richard, uh, am I, can people still hear me? Yes, they can hear you and me. Okay, you cut out for a sec. Um, yeah, I, I assume making OPSEC idiot proof is what you said? Yeah. Yeah, okay, sure. Um, so think about maybe you've, you've worked out your OPSEC example and a VPN is the right thing for you. Make it so your computer, if it's not connected to the VPN, just won't connect to the internet. So you essentially have your computer it connects to VPN, then you have a separate firewall between it and your internet connection that only allows you to connect to the VPN. So you get drunk, you go on your computer, you can't possibly fail to click open your VPN client because then you don't, uh, if you do, it just won't work. And exactly, humans are the, the main point of failure there. Um, another example is you might be doing all your, your hacking from virtual machines. So don't have hacking tools outside of your virtual machines because then you could accidentally use the ones on your real computer. Or you might say, you know, the right OPSEC protocol, one of the things you need to do is make sure that you wipe your virtual machines every time you use them so that there's no data between sessions. So configure it so that they automatically wipe every time you turn your computer on rather than it actually having to be a manual step. It's all about automating all of the manual things away and leaving it so that if anything that has to be done manually is forgotten, you just can't get to the internet at all or you can't get to your tools and you can't get to your systems. Hmm. I remember you once had a really good point about using different tool chains for different personas. Do you want to? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so, so that was another thing. So essentially, that's more at the very high end of what cyber criminals do and 
but essentially, if people are doing a big operation to break into someone that has high-end security and they're going to invest a lot of time, they'll actually buy dedicated hardware, like all the way down from chip serial numbers all the way up to operating system serial numbers. There's tons of things that could give away your identity. Particularly the past few years, more defenders, particularly government defenders, do active defense, which means they change their configurations and things and they try to evict you. But it also means they might try to compromise you as you're compromising them. So you sort of need to assume that everything about your hardware, if you've got a camera that, that if they hack your computer, they could look through at your camera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, lots of people who do these kind of things, they actually go and they buy a system and they go and buy an off the shelf computer and operating system install and all those kind of things. And they just use that for one activity. And then when it's done, they get rid of it. And then never use it again. They don't give it to a charity because that could be chased. They just destroy it end to end on the off chance that someone actually managed to collect a bunch of information. Um, at the same time, people do this for tool chains. So if you look into things like Stuxnet and Flame and the government sponsored malware that's been developed to do things that are like infiltrate nuclear power plants and stuff like that. Um, there's actually components in common between those and people have been able to link organizations and actually say, you know, malware one and malware two and malware three have similar authors or similar heritage because they use different components. So in response to that, lots of people who develop attack technologies, um, they start from scratch all the time. But that's very, very, very expensive, which has meant that they all try to be as minimalist as possible. They try to only write custom tools if they absolutely need to and just use things that are off the shelf commodity things. And that's called uh, living off the land. And if you Google living off the land hacking, you'll find a bunch of articles about the rise of that over the past couple of years because it's just too expensive to develop systems. Cool. Thank you. Um, there's a question on the comments. What you think of uh, something you enter into the lock screen that wipes the drive? Oh, I guess that's a bit like the kill switch on the nail bomb. Well, I wouldn't put too much effort into it because. Yeah, by thinking that those things are going to keep you safe if you're in some sort of scenario like that, you're assuming that it's quicker and cheaper for the people who are your adversaries to come to your house and physically seize your device while you're looking so that you could be able to delete it. Or even if you have the kind of thing, which is if you don't do something sneaky, it'll delete itself. I think that there's always a good chance that this day and age, they're more likely to actually hack the system that you're using without you knowing, without physically seizing it, than come and physically seize it. I really think that there's just a natural human tendency to really invest in that end of the, the evident side of the, scenario but realistically more and more people are going to jail for hacking without evidence because on a balance of probabilities it's more likely that they did it than anyone else if that makes sense yes that's great yeah it's almost too late then i would think it's like you're trying to yes. stop a flood miles down river yeah it's way too late and even if you didn't do it if you get to that point they'll probably watch you for a very long time that was good um, are there any more questions? I had a question. Uh, sorry. There's two. Just one go and then the other. Um, Brendan, I was wondering what your thoughts were on VPN companies that can't give logs in court. What do you mean by can't use logs in court? They, well, the court asks them for logs and they say, we can't give you any because we didn't make, we didn't keep logs. Yeah, look, 
I mean, people really want VPNs to work and be useful for this thing, like for hacking, and they're, they're just really not. Um, I don't think that if you're being investigated for any kind of serious hacking, asking people to present logs in court is what going to is what the intelligence agencies would do. They compromise the systems if they don't record the logs. They just record the traffic some other way. Um, if you're talking the really high end of town, they can also just monitor all the traffic on both sides of the VPN provider's connection to see what comes in or what comes out and do all sorts of timing things to tie traffic together. Um, VPN companies that don't provide logs in court are very good if you want to do piracy and you want to download movies and TV shows and comic books. They're not an effective mechanism for trying to hide hacking. Cool, thank you. There was another question from someone. Uh, yeah. Um, so what's your opinion on um, um, hackers hiding um, their exact um, like location or whatever instead of using a VPN, just war driving and finding a totally random place to try to... It probably actually offers more protection than most VPNs would. Um, it only works at a certain scale. So if you're doing a one-off activity, you take your car somewhere like a high crime area, you break into a Wi-Fi network, change your MAC address, there's almost no chance unless you're doing something really, really bad that anyone's going to go to the effort of trying to work out that, who that was and where they are. If you're doing that time and time and time again, and you're connecting to the same targets over and over again from different networks, and your adversary is law enforcement, in this day and age, if you're carrying a mobile phone or a smartwatch, or your car has GPS in it, um, it's probably scarier, like in that sort of, if you're doing 20, 30 connections, you probably actually would appear in data but once again it comes back to the adversary kind of thing does that make sense it, it, but yeah definitely better than a vpn right yeah that does make sense i didn't actually consider the whole mobile phone thing thank you <laughs> i think the dread pirate roberts was caught in a library wasn't he i don't know was he yeah. yeah i think he was and they had to like catch him at the right time so they could pull his computer away from him um Presumably he'd just gone to that same library too many times and maybe had a... The other fun thing about uh, Dread Pirate Roberts was the fact that he... Um, uh, one of the ways he got caught is that they found IDs, like fake IDs that were addressed to him um, that he sent to himself, which was kind of silly. Um, the other thing I was going to say as well is the Gruck, I think, mentions at one point getting people to buy him um, SIM cards so that they're like anonymous and he can do internet stuff over those. Yeah, yeah. So my one word of caution on what the Gruck does and says versus probably what you should is the Gruck has a fair amount of protection provided by who he is and what he does for other governments around the world that you won't necessarily have. Like, and I think that governments would struggle to really untangle all the messy businesses that he's involved in, as opposed to, is he involved in messy business? So a lot of the techniques there, which are like, you know, I've got 500 SIM cards and everyone, I, I, I swap meet them and people give me 50 and I give them 50 and we shuffle and no one knows who's who. It's still really clear that there's crime going on. Um, who is Satoshi Nakamoto? Nice try. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so, like, let's say you were trying to, like, hide from, I don't know, nation state actors like the NSA or something. What would you be doing? What would your hints be? I, I'd start with, I wouldn't be giving lectures on OPSEC um, to university classes. Um, 
it was probably look yeah okay i i might i know some people who hide from those people and whether or not they need to i don't know maybe they're just very paranoid and don't need to maybe they do need to what they don't do is they don't talk to anyone about computer hacking at all ever they don't go to hacker cons they don't go to the good things like really does where all the defenders are they don't go to the parties where the attackers are they just pretend they're not involved in the entire thing lots of them have jobs like php developer um I know a very famous hacker that works in a pet store in the US. So the people who are very paranoid are very paranoid. And that's probably the, the first thing that they do is not, not be involved in the cybersecurity scene at all. Because, you know, like what? One in a couple of thousand people might have something to do with cybersecurity. I think the industry is growing nicely. So, yeah, one in a couple of thousand might be an okay number. Um, probably still a bit high. That's still making it a much smaller search space. So I think tip number one would be stay away from the entire everything to do with the scene if you are hiding from those people. Number two would be seriously assess whether or not you need to or want to and just really think about the fact that I wouldn't, I, I, I don't, won't necessarily say this for the US government, but lots of other governments, particularly some of the ones that aren't as Western, if you're making adversary of those, they just don't care about rule of law. They don't care about due process. They don't care about, are we sure this is the person? If you're really into those spy games and you're not a spy, you're probably asking for like a really bad outcome. No one do that, okay? Yeah, or like, if you're going to do that, work for another spy agency, like legitimately. Like that, that's, they're the people who train their people on how to evade detection, right? So if you want to know who's the best at hiding from the CIA, it's probably the KGB and vice versa. I have a question about Grauk. Is that how you pronounce it? I don't know. I searched it, and there's a Wikipedia article, and on the Google page, it says, old mate, professionally known as Grauk, is a South African security researcher, etc. And then you click on the Wikipedia link, and it says there is no Wikipedia page. I was also just looking into that. Apparently, <laughs> it got removed for lack of notability. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Let's have a game is played. You can you can use the cache view from Google to look at the Wikipedia article, and then you can click on the button that says like discussion about why they remove it. If you want to read more, it's a pretty short discussion though. <laughs> I'll have a go. Does anyone have any more questions for Brendan? While we've got him, this is your chance of a lifetime. Yeah, I, I have, have a question. question. Oh, oh, you go, you go Brendan. You go. Oh, okay. Um, my question is not so like technical related, but more so, um, I guess the most important thing for OPSEC is having a good personal threat model initially. So you're actually protecting what's important. I was just wondering if you have any tips on how to perform a good personal threat model for people who like don't have a background in security or like people who have absolutely no technical skills. Sure. Um, so it's very hard to threat model yourself. So you should think about someone else that you should try to do it third person. You should think about someone very similar to you, but then try to threat model them. Um, lots of all sorts of security and cyber security in particular. It's all about like being very good at it requires you to constantly flip between thinking in attack and thinking in defense back and forward. If you're an attacker, you need to think how a defender is going to think if you're a defender. You need to understand what the attack is thinking. So I'd start with externalizing it and pretending it's someone else, but very similar to you and how you would catch them. And then think about like, you know, 
I guess it kind of comes down to strategy as well in terms of what you're trying to achieve. Like, you know, say you want to hack KFC and steal their secret recipe. Here's your adversaries there. And then just start listing out, all right, well, you know, it's, it's every police person in the world because they're going to religiously defend KFC, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then once you start listing out the adversaries, you can start working out what you would need to do to remain under the radar or hidden from all of those people. Um, if you're just talking about general operational security, like not in terms of you're going to do an operation, you just want to understand how you could make your own life more secure, right? Because OPSEC can be, you can have no intent, whether ill or good, and still need OPSEC, right? So like, I know a guy who's had a lot of intelligence agency training and was a counter-terrorist for a long time. And he won't walk to the same place the same way twice. So he always takes a different route. And he memorizes a map of where he's gonna walk and doesn't actually decide which way he's gonna go until he leaves the house. Um, he doesn't get out of trains until the very last second when the door's closing. So he basically stands in the train and he stays in the room uh, where the door is and he doesn't get out of the stop until the door's about to close. So if someone's following him on the train, they actually are forced to uh, change up, which means that because you generally follow people in a group, effectively means that he buys some time there um it's those kind of patterns and you can get good at threat modeling yourself by just writing down what you do and then looking for everything that if you were going to attack yourself in any way you would be able to predict because really that's that's what opsec is all about it's about remaining hidden and one way to remain hidden is to be unpredictable if that makes sense. Yeah, okay, thanks so much. Welcome. Hi, um, I have another question. So earlier um, during the talk, you said that you can be famous and you can be a hacker, but you can't be a famous hacker. Um, so what are your comments on Kevin Mitnick? Um, I make my comments on Kevin Mitnick very clear um, in, in my first lecture of comp 6447 but i effectively don't really think kevin mitnick is much of a hacker really um i think that he if like there's lots of definitions of the word hacker and i think the gruck is using it in the word of someone who's breaking into computers without permission kevin mitnick hasn't done that since he got caught and i mean he's gone and talked at conferences and written books and talked to people who are hackers but he definitely hasn't talked about getting caught. Uh, he, he definitely hasn't talked about, or as far as anyone's aware, done any hacking since he got caught. And I'm not necessarily sure he could. He does security engagements and he used to do pen testing before he just kind of went on speaking to us. But I would say that he hasn't done anything that qualifies for being real hacking in a very long time. And when he did, like, you know, he's the first famous hacker, I guess, he really got in before there were serious penalties for the kind of crimes he committed. If you have a look at people who did similar crimes more recently, the punishments are far more steep. If you have a look at UT, um, you could Google that, the Unix terrorist, he got caught a few years ago actually just for supplying tools to someone else that hacked a bunch of things and stole a bunch of credit card numbers. The penalties and restrictions are like, I think he owes something like 150 million US dollars to the, uh, in compensation. Um, yeah. I, I think that because he, he kind of got in early, it was possible. It's not possible now. Yeah, also, he's gone to jail and been released, hasn't he? So he's essentially, he can talk safely. He's famous for what he talks about, about what he did before, which presumably is safe-ish for him. Um, yes. Right. I see. All right, thank you. Um, I had a question about the 
elusive VPNs as well. You talked about how um, with Tor, if you were able to sort of route it from Australia, Canada, America, as opposed to Russia, China, or Iran sort of thing. If you were to have, so if we assume that all VPNs have logs and all VPNs are gonna give that over actively, if you had one VPN provider in Iran, one VPN provider in Russia, and you put the two together, or Iran and America and you put the two together, is that not a similar thing? You've got to rely on the cooperation of those two governments um, and you're able to do a bit more than through Tor? Because the yeah. VPN provider doesn't know what the other one's doing because it's, yeah, the left hand doesn't know the right hand kind of thing. Yeah, to a, to a certain extent, chaining VPNs together is exactly what hackers do when they bounce, although they generally don't buy VPNs, they just hack systems or buy hacked systems at the various layers, like the China, Iran, Russia, they're, they're all hacked systems and they connect them together with their own VPN software. But yeah, that's effectively what multi-step bouncing looks like. But you need to be very careful that you're really understanding, like basically you have the same version of the software that you think they're using, at least the same clients, and you're analyzing to make sure that nothing actually leaks at the various spots that would give away more than you think. But yes, chaining VPNs together is much better than using one as long as you do it right. Doing it right is more work than it probably sounds like up front. Mm, that's fantastic. Um, I'm aware of time, but also I don't want to cut any questions. Are you, how are you? Do you have another minute or two if there was another question? Yeah, I can do more questions. There's a discussion in the comments about the legality of uh, Tor and the consensus is it is legal from what I'm reading, but I was curious on some legitimate uses for Tor, because I only really hear about Ill illegitimate uses. Well, I guess like one person's criminal is another person's freedom fighter. Um, but I mean, you can use Tor to do Woolworths shop online. Um, people use Tor to do their everyday banking you can just use it the same way that anyone uses it. It's just if you don't want the site you're connecting to to know who you are, then that lets you hide the network side of things. And there's there's lots of reasons you might want to do that that aren't illegal or illegitimate. Um, you might want to donate to the Republican Party, but you don't want your partner to find out that you'd ever do such a thing. Um, you might want to <laughs> whistleblow at work and share information on something that's happening that you think people should know about without that being able to be traced back to you. There's lots of real reasons people will use Tor. Um, but if you were to look at what percentage of Tor traffic is probably for something shady versus what percentage of regular internet traffic, I'd say that Tor is definitely much higher. Yeah, cheers. Thank you. But uh, that just what, one thing there, that, that comes down to performance. If Tor performed well enough that you couldn't tell you were using it. It probably would just have a decent mix of legitimate traffic. And that's probably what next gen anonymizing networks are going to be, have to look like to be successful. Yeah, right. That makes sense. Um, so I remember a lot of embassies used to use it. Yeah. Embassies use it. Um, and, and people use it if they don't want to be, so like, Client siding is basically when you hack into someone's, <coughs> sorry, clients, like you hack into their web browser when they browse a certain web page. Embassies are often targeted by governments who can intercept their traffic and try to break into their computers. So Tor gives them protection against that kind of attack as well. Um, do we have time for one more question? Because I have yep. a um, so I typed in the chat earlier, how important do you think OPSEC is as a field? Where else do you think it finds some concrete use? Look, I think there's an entire emerging field of defense called cyber intel. Um, there's some really good companies. One I know of called Intel 471 are really good. You could probably Google them to get an idea of what the cyber intel community do. They're 95% OPSEC, like they 
those in that industry, cyber intel, is all about infiltrating the bad guys or the attackers or the adversary or whatever you want to call them, pretending to be one of them so you can gather information so that you can do a better job of defending and vice versa. It's essentially a new field. Like uh, I don't think it would have existed outside of government five years ago. Most large organizations do it like, so I work at Combank. I look after a cyber Intel team of about eight people at Combank that do that as a full time job, like cyber Intel, which is, receiving and sharing and information, but also implementing those kind of techniques. Um, so I think that, yeah, it definitely is a growing thing where being able to implement OPSEC chains to keep yourself anonymous or invisible to a certain extent, but then also being able to understand other people so you can work out who they are and attribute attacks to various groups it's a whole field of cybersecurity and it's probably, it's probably going to be a very big field in the next few years. Yeah, thanks. Can I ask one last question as well? Yep, last one. Um, how, how do we learn more? How do we, how do we yeah, and go and do this, I suppose? So I think start, start following the Gruck on Twitter. Uh, read what he says. Uh, look up. Uh, Google for frack.com and look at the articles there on forensics and counter forensics. And then I think look into some cyber intel sort of things. I might, I might send Richard a list of things a uh, reading that Richard if you might do that over the weekend and you could send it out. Wonderful. Cool. Thank you. Look, there are really great questions from everyone. And Brendan, I really appreciate you spending um, this amount of time just helping these guys. So, again, thank you so much. Can we, everyone, just turn their mics off again? Oh, again, and let's give them a big round of applause. Oh, come on. <laughs> Zoom claps. Everyone, All right, thanks, everyone. Okay, see you, Brendan. You. Thanks. See you. Bye bye. Oh, that was pretty good. Um, Okay, so we were um, really lucky to get him. And there are lots of other great speakers that we get from time to time. Uh, and in all the chaos of this term, we haven't lined up as well, hardly any at all. Um, often I try and get one a week. So, so that you don't miss out on this experience, in future years, as we run this course again, you should know you are always welcome to come back and join in. Uh, and attend talks and um, just sort of stay connected to everything. Those of you who keep doing the security courses anyway, and will probably tutor this course and so on, will stay connected. But even if, um, uh, even if you're not, just work out a way of staying connected with us. Probably, st I imagine next year, I'll make announcements on this course's homepage as well as on the new course, just so everyone can know. And I don't mind you enrolling in the new course unofficially and just sort of sitting in and watching. Now, look, there's been a couple of, um, there's been a couple of rude things on the, on the chat. I don't, I don't like it. I, I'm going to go back and look through the chat history now. Can everyone just make sure that we are all uh, respectful to each other? Um, I, I don't really want to say it or go into it in any more detail because it should just happen, but uh, it, it really is quite serious because we want to be a community here and you don't become a community by um, being rude to other people in the community. So just don't joke about it. Just don't do it. Just be cool to everyone and everyone will be cool back to you. These are the people that you'll be working with or surrounded with for the rest of your life. So get a good reputation with everyone up front. Um, now I want to uh, move on now or move on, move back now to talking about what we're talking uh, before we were so rudely interrupted by Brendan. Uh, and that was, we were talking about those two puzzles from the end of the last lecture. And the first one was coin toss. And if you remember, we had a really clever solution from everyone. Everyone, what's your real name? Uh, your real first name? Um, it's Gaurav. Oh, it's you, Gaurav. Oh, um, so yeah, really good idea that um, essentially involved simultaneity, uh, allowing us to, um, like I was doing when I was doing that scissor, paper, rock with that student. Um, uh, scissor, paper, rock, we were both saying it at the same time and due to internet lag, sometimes I'd say it first and sometimes he'd say it first. Um, but 
we were sort of committed to what we were saying. So we couldn't start saying scissors and then change to saying paper midway when you heard what the other person was saying. And that whole idea is um, the essential idea to make this thing work. And that's called commitment. Essentially, if you want to have a fair coin toss, you have to commit to an outcome before the outcome is revealed. So if I wanted to convince you that I knew who was going to win the horse race tomorrow, some random horse race, I wouldn't wait till after the race and say, yeah, I knew it was him. Uh, that's like a Monday's hero in football, someone who afterwards claims they knew stuff. If you really want to be impressive, then you'd have to set a commitment up before the thing happened. So you'd say, I'm going to write down who won it on a piece of paper and stick it in an envelope. And after, and I'll give it to someone you trust. And after the envelope, after the race, we'll open the envelope and see. And they, what's written inside the envelope then is your commitment. And sometimes you need the commitment to be secret because knowing the commitment could influence the outcome of the event. And sometimes uh, it doesn't matter and the commitment can be open. But either way, it has to be a commitment to be impressive. So um, Nostradamus, impressive because he made his predictions and committed them to paper. So if they ever happen and they're written on a piece of paper, we're impressed. So with the coin toss, with commitment, um, with a proper commitment, so simultaneity is one way of getting it. If we want to serialize, we can't use simultaneity and it is hard to serialize. Well, let's be honest, it's probably impossible to serial, to do simultaneity, guaranteed simultaneity. It should. Yeah. Your camera's off. I don't know if that's intentional. Oh, thank you. Uh, how's that? I can see me now. That's a bit distracting. Um, so... Uh, yeah, so if we serialize things, if things are serialized and you can't have things simultaneously, we can still get a fair coin cost as long as we have commitment. Uh, and how that would work would be something like, um, uh, maybe I'm doing it with Tom. Tom and I each write down a number on a piece of paper and stick it in an envelope. Um, we send those envelopes, encrypt them or do something, send them to the third party. The third party looks at both envelopes. And if we trusted the third party, um, Actually, if we trusted the third party, they could just do the coin toss. So I guess trusted third parties, a bit inconvenient here. But just the general principle here is they could look at both of our numbers and if mine, we, and they could just look at their parity, even or odd. And if we both had even, we could say Tom won. And if we all both had odd, we'd say Tom won. And if there were mixed parity, we'd say I won. So there's obviously a 50-50 chance there. Um, uh, and that's something I was going to say about your um, number strategy, Gaurab, that um, when I was, the sums of, two numbers being another number, that's not a uniform distribution. Like um, if we each pick a number between one to four, there's fewer ways of us getting a sum that adds up to two. There's no way of getting a sum that adds up to one. There's only one way of getting a sum that adds up to eight, but there's quite a few ways of getting a sum that adds up to six. We could have a three and a three or a four and a two. Um, oh, that's it. So um, there's a bit of a weight more towards the middle if things are truly random and things. Um, so, and maybe if I pick a number, I can see if I know the number and then I know you're picking a number randomly from one to four, that narrows it down to a selection of four that we could pick. If I could find a, th a four which had three tails and one head in it, for example, I would pick a number that moved it into that zone. And then you'd, so, so we do have to be careful of any, um, any complications can hide things always go for simple. So uh, making it odds or even or parity, that's about as simple as you can get. Um, can I make a point about that? Oh yeah, Tom, shoot. Um, one of the things that I thought was interesting about that solution is that there's a little time delay between when both people commit and when they know the answer. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the point is that you need to extend that time delay as long as possible, because it means that like uh, the only way that I know that this thing is over is it when I've heard your number and I figured out what that result is. But yes. if we both know it takes us like five seconds to get to the results, then yes. if I get your answer within four seconds, I know that there's no way that you knew it early, kind of. So if you extend how long that track is, or you devise a protocol where it takes, you know, two or three seconds to figure out the answer, yeah. there's no way that you can lie about it. You're sort of verified. Yeah, that's right. I see what you're saying. You can... Um we might not need perfect simultaneity if we're using simultaneity to give us um, a commitment um, because uh, it might be that even knowing what he said, I still have to spend some time before I find its true meaning. Uh, and so for example, we send each other an encrypted head or tail and it's in, we can only break that encryption with brute force and it might take us an hour to break. So essentially I've given you an envelope that's sealed. that's going to take you an hour to open up. Or even, actually, if it was hard enough to encrypt, we don't even need to both do it. I could just send you, Tom, an envelope um, saying, um, 
a, a number from one to 10 and it might take you an hour to open it. And then you can publicly say, I predict it's an even number. And as long as the timing, as you point out, that window is right, I know you haven't had time to, um, uh, to decrypt it in that time. And then when you do decrypt it, we both know you've decrypted it accurately and that um, yeah, yeah. But essentially can I, sort of can I say one other thing about that very quickly. You absolutely can. Uh, you proposed an encryption system where you would encrypt either heads or tails. I don't know if everyone has seen that XKCD, but it's basically where they like part of their encryption system was that they translated zero and one into uh, Navajo. And they were like, Oh, nobody will figure this out. It, but it says only two choices. So yeah, if yeah. you're only encrypting true or false, you've got to be kind of careful about that one. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's right. Otherwise it's just um, an elaborate, elaborate substitution cipher where <laughs> true is turned into 97 P42 3 Yeah. So you have to do, um, uh, so there's a couple of ways of dealing with that. Either you put padding in and that's what happened with the Merkle puzzles. For example, you have um, some non-deterministic padding in the message. So you can't just brute force all the things. So you could say, for example, um, heads, and then followed by a, a random 700 digit number. And the other person could write tails followed by a random 700 digit number. And as long as your cipher then wasn't one of those ones like a stream cipher where, you know, the parts of the cipher text that correspond to the, the parts of the plain text, as long as it was a block cipher and it had that nice avalanche type property, then um, that random number hides the whole thing. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I don't know how long you want to stay on this for, but what if you first proposed a number, say you say four and he says three, and then you each also propose a string of true or falses that are pseudo random, and then you XOR your string that you proposed together with his one. And that way you like your number and your string are not inherent. Like you're not looking at your string and then choosing a number based off that, but also you can't choose your string based off your number because you're XORing it with their number. Sorry, with their string. So it's kind of like mixed. And isn't the, the, the fundamental properties there is still the, the simultaneity though. So you're just adding more simultaneity. Yeah, I think write it up, write it up, Oliver, because I could imagine a couple of different interpretations of what you're saying. And I have yeah, okay. other ideas there. Write it up and, and absolutely share it and we'll analyze it. And you analyze it too. Um, yeah. There is this really nice property that was sort of hiding in what you were saying, which is, if we have two secrets or two messages and we XOR them together, XORing does have this lovely property that as long as one of those messages is good in various ways, the result will be good. So if we XOR um, something with a random string, the output will always be random. Uh, and that's sort of proof against someone maliciously picking something non-random if you've then XORed it with something random. Uh, there's lots of different ways of doing cryptographic safe to coin toss. Everyone should look them up, but I just want you to uh, know at least one or two, but I just want you to point out, uh, understand that the idea underlying them all to make it work is a commitment that essentially one of you commits or both of you commit. And then, then in that time window, the thing, the commitment is shared between you. And then when you both know it, you undo the commitment. And we'll see examples of that actually that we'll do in this course quite soon. Um, so that's the heart of a solution to coin toss, but it's not a full solution yet. And uh, Oliver's going to try and get one. And I want everyone to think how you could use commitments to get coin tosses. One way of doing a commitment, for example, is, um, is this. Uh, so you can't use this one now. I, I take the word head or tails and then I stick a random 900 digit number to the end. And then I hash it using a good hash algorithm like SHA, you know, SHA3, maybe one of those. Um, then I share the hash with you publicly and we both see the hash. And then you try and guess if I said heads or tails publicly in the open and you say heads and I go, ah, oh, sorry, it was tails. So you make the call and I say what it was. And then I reveal my number of my string and you can rehash it and check. Now, the nice thing about hashes, and this is now why we start to see why we like hashes and we wanted them to have some of those properties we we're talking about is um, there's no way that I can come up with another message that starts with the word heads that has that same hash as I think I originally said tails as the original message I had with tails followed by a number. I can't find another image with another number with the same image. That's like a secondary image attack. So 
uh, it means if I come up with a message that contains either head or tails and a whole lot of numbers after it, you're pretty sure that's what I started with because just there's no way of constructing such a thing after the event working backwards. So the one wayness of hash functions is a really nice way of doing commitments. And in fact, that's sort of what you do if you're downloading a file. I'll give you the hash to tell you what the file, the hash of the file, the fingerprint of the file, then you download the file, then you rehash it and check it. And essentially, I've committed to what file I'm sending you by publishing the hash. In fact, you, yeah. I was, so the attack you're talking about is hash collision, is that right? Uh, this would be a, a particular sort of hash collision. A normal hash collision is just finding any two uh, colliding messages. But here, I want you to give me uh, a Well, it's a specific attack because I have to find a second number that hashes the same way. Yeah, yeah. So the constraints are you want the number to be small enough that there's uh, no domain for me to even try to find a collision if I could do it fast enough, but large enough that I can't brute force it. Oh, sorry. Say the first one. I didn't get that. So, so depending on how large your number is, assuming I had a quantum computer and I could do it instantaneously, oh, gotta, I could brute force a collision. Yeah, you've won. You've won if you've got a quantum computer. But if I know that your number is only, say, five digits, oh, yeah. if I exhaust that space and there's no collision in that space, then I can't um, collide it. Oh, I see. Um, no, don't worry about the presence of collisions because there's always collisions. I mean, no, you're right. If you make it small enough, there won't always be ones. But small enough there, as you pointed out, yeah, I understand what you're saying now. The If it's small enough space that you, you <laughs> there's not going to be collisions, it's so small that it can be brute forced over because the size of the hashes are so small. So, yeah, right. don't worry about collisions. You just are relying on the difficulty of finding the damn things. So there's no sweet spot. No, unfortunately not. I would say um, the, the best hash function you can have and the longer you can have is your, is your best bet. Yeah. What would stop them from dehashing it and then answering immediately? Yeah, that's right. Um, if you could dehash, nothing. So that's the whole thing about hash functions that we like. A cryptographic hash is it's resistant against going backwards. So it, it, uh, that's called a pre-image attack. If you can take a hash and work out what came from it, that, that's a pre-image attack. So a cryptographic hash function, you can't do that. It's the opposite of an encryption thing. Encryption is designed to be done and undone. A hash function can't be undone is what you want. I was going to say an example before. Uh, Vicky asked a great question. Uh, got distracted answering it. What was the great example? I was just about to give you a really good algorithm. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. Everyone think themselves now of how you can um, set up uh, commitments and do a distributed coin flip. That would make me very happy if you're able to do that sort of thing. I think I was going to give you an example of how to do it, but it's gone now. Um, Does our answer have to be like resistant to someone guessing based on like psychologically and analyzing you yeah, like no. when you just like guess yeah. um what it is inside like the other person having knowledge of the person who's guessing can easily just use that fact to manipulate the result yeah you're absolutely right there's no way uh, there's no cryptographic solution to that that that's a, a more fundamental weakness you you know we sometimes talk about securities being end to end and what you're talking about here is something that happens before the end like outside, mm -hmm. before the person's even typed their guess into the computer, you can guess what their brain's going to say. But like for the coin toss solution, doesn't it have to be, um, like couldn't you just remove the fact that you have to guess something? Because a coin toss well, is probably not completely random, but like it's not based on the decision of the individual tossing the coin. Yeah, I see what you mean. Uh, Yes, but you have to call heads or tails in a coin toss normally. There's normally this random element and a call element. But yeah, you're right. If it was me doing it and I didn't want you to attack me, I wouldn't, I'd wouldn't. i be suspicious of my own ability to generate a truly random number and I would pick some external source as my random number generator. And I do that when anyone's doing a magic trick on me or something like that where I have to make predictions or do something rather than coming up with a number myself because I reckon I'll follow a pattern without knowing it. I tend to make a decision based on, oh, the next word I hear on the next ta the table adjacent, does it have an odd or even number of letters in it? And that's going to tell me whether I'm saying head or tail or clubs or spades or something. So I just pick something random beyond, or I'm going to look down the menu if we're sitting at a cafe and take the last two digits of the, um, the price of the item 
at the bottom of page three. I'll decide without looking at the menu. And then that'll be a random number between one and a hundred. Probably not. Uh, I don't know. It's probably not. Distribution of digits, as you know, from the online exercise is not random. But yeah, something like that. Digits of pi are quite random, but unfortunately it's such a well-known sequence of random numbers that um, uh, you probably, <laughs> you'd be outthought if you use that. Um, yeah, so really good questions from everyone. Uh, but uh, can you just fool around with the coin toss? Ask me more questions about it next time. Uh, but I'm just hoping I've given you a fun thing to think about. But now I want to talk about the second puzzle, which was what if you wanted to sell a secret? You had a secret and I want you to give me money and I'll tell you the secret, but I have to convince you I know the secret, but I can't tell you the secret or I've blown it and you'll not give me the money sort of thing. And it's a bit like, um, oh, anyway, don't worry. That's a, a very funny sidetrack. So this sort of problem uh, is solved by things called zero knowledge protocols. And I've written down here, zero KP. A zero knowledge protocol is one where you engage in the protocol and at the end, all the people that were involved in the protocol know no more, zero, zero knowledge. They know no more about anything except one specific thing that the prot protocol is designed to convince them of. So it's like this perfect sanitizing or cleanliness thing. So if I wanted to convince you, so it's trying to get rid of all side channels. So if I wanted to convince you, oh, I don't know, um, that I carried out a procedure correctly. So you've given me a number and I've encrypted it. And I want to persuade you that I've encrypted the number correctly uh, using some key. Uh, and I don't know, and I've obeyed all these rules. If only there was some way I could convince you I'd done that without giving away what key I'd used or anything like that. So you can believe it's a fair encryption and it could be decrypted by someone, but I'm not actually decrypting it for you or telling you. So that would be an example of a hard problem. If there was a zero knowledge protocol solution to that, at the end of me doing this protocol, showing you things and doing things like that, you'd be utterly convinced that I had encrypted it fairly, but you would know nothing at all, absolutely nothing, not even a millionth of a little bit about what I'd done, how I'd done it, anything other than the thing I was trying to persuade you. So what the key was, perhaps if part of the secret is what the original message was, you wouldn't know what the original message was, so on, so on, so on, so on. So zero knowledge protocols seem almost impossible. We use them a lot in online voting or, or internet voting because in an internet voting, for example, you want to persuade, suppose it's an Australian election. So we've got preferences. Everyone votes first preference for this person, second preference for this person. And then there's this very elaborate process at the end of combining all this preference information to pick out the most liked or least disliked candidate, as opposed to countries like England or America, which usually um, have a first past the post system. So everyone votes and whoever gets the most votes, number one wins. Uh, and that's um, simpler to do, but it has this danger that if there's two say, uh, left-wing candidates and one right-wing candidate and half your population is left-wing and half is right-wing, then the right-wing candidate gets all the right-wing votes, but the left-wing candidate split, the two of them split the left-wing votes and the right one gets in. And that would happen even if there were more left votes in total. Than the, and, and actually in Australia, that happens quite often. The person that wins the popular vote, the, uh, the, the, if you added the total number of votes together, across the country and who the party that got the majority votes sometimes don't get to control parliament um, because you know everything's just a bit confusing so um so preferential voting is a sort of a way of trying to deal with the, the particular issue of vote splitting um but the challenge of preferential voting is it's quite long you go through this elaborate process of essentially chucking out the most hated person and redistributing their votes over everyone else and then finding the next most hated person and chucking them out and redistributing all the people that have voted for them and so on so on so on, so on. and it iterates and it's long and slow and tedious so if you wanted to do an online election and you wanted to i don't know everyone's voted so you've got everyone's votes but you're keeping everyone's identity secret and you wanted to somehow convince someone that, or even you, you knew, ah, here's one, the way one of the electric, electric online systems works. There's a public bulletin board and on that, everyone can read the public bulletin board. It can't be edited. There's various black and blockchain mechanisms on it that stop it from being altered. Um, and it can be publicly seen. And on that is everyone's vote, which has been encrypted. And, and the vote has all these random numbers and so on after it. So we don't have that attack Tom was talking about of just being able to, <laughs> encrypt all the plain text and, and see what the cipher tech, corresponding cipher texts are. So everyone has a vote which can't be decrypted, but it's encrypted on the internet and it's attached to their identity. Suppose that. 
So that way I can check that everyone who's allowed to vote has voted and only people that have voted have voted because I can actually see the names of it or the ID or whatever of everyone that's voted and I can see the encrypted vote next to them. But of course, now I can never learn how to decrypt votes because if I could decrypt a vote, then I could work out how someone's voted. And that's absolute disaster in this system of what we call secret ballot. So what happens is the electoral authority takes all the votes and they jumble them all up and then they decrypt them. And when they jumble them up, they lose the people's identities in how they do the shuffling, a bit like Tor, actually. So how do I know that while they're jumbling it, that they really are jumbling it? They're not throwing away all the original votes and sticking in a whole lot of fake votes. And then when it comes out of the Tor network, decrypting all the fake votes uh, and counting them up. How do I know they haven't fiddled around with it while it's being jumbled? Well, how that's solved is with a zero knowledge protocol. Someone produces a zero knowledge protocol that proves that all the input votes when they were jumbled and shuffled, were jumbled and shuffled legitimately without really being altered in any way at all, and they correspond to the output of jumbled votes. Convinces you of that fact, but does not let you know one millimeter of information about how the jumbling actually happened, so you can't trace back. That's a zero-knowledge protocol. So that's an example of where they're used. So they seem pretty remarkable things to be able to have. How can you have something, not that I can't think of any information it's leaking. How can you have it so I can prove that it doesn't leak any information except the deliberate information? So let's look at some examples of that. Now I went onto Wikipedia today because I was like stealing my pictures from Wikipedia because people have gone to enormous efforts to explain things clearly on Wikipedia with nice pictures. Now there weren't any good pictures for zero knowledge protocols there, but there was a new example that I'd never seen before. So let's use that one because the classic example I really hate. It's about the people in a cave. It's the most lame, horrible example. So here's how zero knowledge protocol could go. Um, let me tell you one thing on the path towards a zero knowledge protocol that I actually did last, or maybe the year before in this course. So it's not exactly a zero knowledge protocol, but it's done to show the shape of how they would look. I said, someone said, is the exam really hard? And I said, no, exam's not hard. It's an easy exam. And I said, how do we know it's not an easy exam? You know, you're a bit chaotic. Maybe you think it's an easy exam, but it actually is a hard exam. I said, no, I'm pretty sure it's an easy exam. And I said, yeah. And how do we know that the questions aren't on things that, you know, we haven't studied because the sample exam you've given us is from a previous year. And I know you teach different things every year. How do I know I'm freaking out looking at the past exam because it's got things I can't answer. And I said, yeah, but they're not in the course this year. And they go, how do we know that? How do we know that you're not giving us a question? It's, you know, how, how do I know that the exam's safe? And I thought, okay, so I have to convince them that the exam is not too hard and doesn't have questions on things they wouldn't know. But of course, I can't tell them the exam. It has to be out of secret. I can't leak anything about the exam at all. So I came up with a protocol that we carried out. Can anyone think zero knowledge is me exams? Yes, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, don't forget the other side of zero knowledge. The important thing is it's zero knowledge about anything except the main thing. It's not zero knowledge about everything. That's, that's no good at all. So um, can anyone think how we could have done that? It was a very simple protocol. How would I convince you? We could even do it this year if I've got enough time. How can I convince you the exam wasn't hard? but not give away anything about the actual exam. Because obviously I could show you the exam. That's, it. that's the easiest way of doing it. But that's given away too much information. So here's what If I we think the exam, we do a redo? Say again? If you think that the, if we think the exam is too hard, then we just get a redo? Oh yeah, that'd be nice. That, well, okay. So that solves the overall problem, but it doesn't solve the specific version of it I gave. So yeah, that's a really clever solution. And we or it just gives you two really hard exams. <laughs> But infinite, assuming an infinite number of exams, number of redos, but they're all <laughs> each time they're the same as the previous one with extra questions added, they get harder each time. Um, no, uh, they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't. Um, no, uh, but I don't, I actually want you to be convinced before doing the exam that it's not going to be a hard exam. I'll tell you how I did it. Because when I write the exam, it's really hard to write an exam. It takes ages. And you, I just go for a long walk or I guess these days just walk around and around the, the toilet <laughs> 100 million times. That's a long walk in these times of COVID, isn't it? Um, so I go for a long walk and I just brainstorm and I think of questions and I think and I think hard and I think hard. And then I normally come back with a scrap of paper that's got like 500 questions on it. 
And then I go through that and picking out what I think are the best ones and the hardest, not the hardest ones, the easiest ones and the ones that are most satisfying and the ones that are best, fairest and so on. Anyway, what I did was I wrote out, the exam had 20 short questions on it. So I actually wrote 40 questions. And then I snipped them out and I put them in a hat. And I went into the lecture theater and I said, guys, you can, someone can just put their hand in and pull out a question and read it and we can talk about it in class and that won't be in the exam. And we can do that 20 times and whatever's left goes in the exam. So we just went around pulling out questions and we talked about a possible exam question and I answered it. And so, so in a sense, anything could have been in the final exam. I had no control over it because the people had the randomness. And if they pulled out 20 questions and actually 18 of them were pretty easy, then they started to think, oh yeah, okay, I just picked those randomly. They could have just as easily been in. And the number of small hard questions was sort of quite small. So do you see well, that? the rest of them are all hard. But that would be bad luck. See, what's the chance? So that's exactly right. But now think about it. If I'm not picking them, if it's genuine randomness, and there's 20 questions picked and 20 not picked, what's the chance of there being 20 hard and 20 easy and you've picked all the easy ones? Yeah, I hear you. What are the chances there are two hats? <laughs> <laughs> that's right <laughs> that's right what's the chance that i really had 30 questions and 10 of them were really hard and i didn't even, i mean 50 questions yeah so no too much work for me um so uh yeah the odds are i mean you could work it out uh what's the chance of getting all the 20 hard ones in a row well the first one the chance of getting a hard one the first time is 20 on on 40 and then and the chance of getting a hard one the next time, well, it'd be uh, an easy one the first time, sorry, would be 20 on 40. And now you've used up one of the easy ones. There's 19 easy left and 20 hard ones. So the next time it's slightly less than a 50% chance of picking uh, one of the easy ones. But suppose you again pick one of the easy ones. The chance of that is now 19 on 39. So it'd be 20 on 40 times 19 on 39. And then, uh, then it'd be times... Uh, what, 18 on 38 times, and you can multiply all that out, but you can see it's better than half each time. I mean, the chance of you pulling it off is, is lower than half each time. So if we just do a simplification and say it's 50-50 each time, but it's actually much better than that, um, then 50-50, you've got to do it 20 times, that's one on two to the 20. Uh, so the chance of getting them all, all the easy ones, is better than one, is, is less than one in two to the 20. And two to the 20 is two to the 10 times two to the 10, it's one in a million. So there'd be one in a million chance of that happening. You can, and actually, it's much lower. So although I haven't utterly proved it, it's just a probabilistic proof, do you see that you're sort of starting to become more convinced? Is everyone happy with that? So once someone picks out all the easy ones in one year, you know you're good for the next million or so. Yes, that's right. that's right. So that's an example of a zero knowledge protocol. Um, it's, it's not, that's not literally a zero knowledge protocol, but it's sort of getting close. So the idea with a zero knowledge protocol is this. We're going to, there's some secret I have to convince you that I know normally. So I'm going to break the secret into two parts. And then you're going to randomly guess which part I show you. And I commit to those, I create a commitment to those two parts, so I can't change them. Maybe it's I've put them behind my back and you're watching me, so I can't. Well, actually, if I was a magician, I could probably change things even while they're behind my back, but I'm holding them in front of me. Which hand has it? Um, so the commitment is, you can see, it's in my hand. Um, and then you get to pick which one, and I open it. And if that somehow gives you confidence in the answer without giving away the answer, then you can see that my chance of tricking you, if one had good and one had bad, uh, my chance of tricking you and getting it wrong is only one in two each time. Uh, let me make a more concrete example. Um, suppose I pretended that I could work out what someone was gonna do in scissor, paper, rock. And to demonstrate it, we did a protocol where I did scissors, paper, rock with someone and I guessed it one time what's the chance that I was just lucky that I don't have this superpower I'm claiming. I'm just lucky. What's the chance I'm lucky? One in three. One in three. That's right. So you're probably not convinced, but what if I could do it twice? What's the chance that I'm actually tricking you rather than having this superpower then? One in three times one in three, one in nine. The real question is, was Lachlan on this beforehand? Or yeah. did he actually that's, that's get right. tricked? It has to be random. So, in fact, Lachlan 
tell us what was the story? How do we do that trick? Yeah, it was predetermined the order. We'd, we'd uh, agreed in advance which order we're going through. Very, very well done, Oliver. But if it was truly random, then the chance of me pulling that off would be so low. I think we did about eight of them. So one on three to the eight. That's a very small number. So you could be... And the comment section goes wild. <laughs> <I'm trying. laughs> um, so so um, here's the thing. Zero knowledge protocols sort of always have this shape of what I was doing with Lachlan then. At the end of the protocol being finished, who's convinced I have this magic power? You can't be, because Lachlan and I could have cheated. There's only one person that could be convinced I have this magic power. Who's that? Lachlan. Lachlan. Because Lachlan's the only one that's knowing if he's cheating or if he is randomly picking each time. And if Lachlan knows he's randomly picking each time, then Lachlan is convinced. Does everyone get that? But you watching it are not convinced because Lachlan and I could have colluded and we could have faked the whole thing. So you watching us carry out this protocol can, can teach you nothing because we could have faked the whole thing. And you obviously can't learn anything from a fake, watching a fake sequence. So even if it's genuine, you can't lose, learn anything. And that's essentially the heart, though I've said it really quickly, of the proof that it's zero knowledge. Because it can be faked, because we can come up with a fake transcript, it's called, if you could watch a recording of it, we can come up with a fake recording where I don't have that power, but I'm able to still trick you with this fake recording. If it's possible to do that, then watching the fake recording can't you tell you anything about my power at all, including any side leaks, because it could entirely be made up. The only person it convinces is Lachlan. So when you have this property, uh, it's zero knowledge and Lachlan yet is still convinced, but not 100%, but probabilistically. And he can repeat the experiment as often as he wants until he really is convinced. So if I was signaling to Lachlan what to do in a way that you couldn't tell, but everyone else could, that would no longer be a zero knowledge protocol. Uh, no, it, it would be a zero knowledge protocol because you'd be telling Lachlan what to do. So you'd be a, uh, the random number generator then. So if I could guess it every single time, you would be the only person that was convinced that I really had this power. So if I was telling Lachlan what to do in a way that everyone else was convinced you didn't know, but they knew what it was, yes. then everyone would know. Everyone would know the sequence you're doing, but no one knows anything about how I'm predicting it. Correct. Yeah. So yeah. Is that still zero knowledge? Yeah, yeah. The, the zero knowledge is you don't learn anything about the secret. It involves a whole lot of random numbers the way you test it. You're allowed to know about the random numbers and things like that. They don't have anything to do with my secret power or they don't have, if we use random numbers to shuffle, uh, um, you know, the, the um, uh, oh no, that's not a good example. If we use random numbers to test how well I've shuffled the votes, knowing the random numbers we use to carry out the test doesn't help you. The only thing you need to know is the random numbers actually used to shuffle them. And, and that's, that's, it's a complicated example because they both use random numbers. I wish I hadn't picked that. But um, yeah, so Mickey, then you'd be the only one that was convinced. If you were telling Lachlan and amazingly, I was guessing every single time, then you would go, oh my God, if, no matter what I say, he guesses it. He must have that power. But Lachlan couldn't know that I really had the power because Lachlan is thinking suspiciously, I bet Richard and Mickey got together in advance and worked out the sequence of numbers. Right. Um, so I wanted to give you the example from Wikipedia because it's such a good one. Of course, you should read the Wikipedia page. Um, there's two there and I want you to, there's one about Hamiltonian cycles that I'd like you to try and understand and look at because that's really cool. And we'll talk about that a bit in the future, maybe in your tune next week or in the lecture if you, can, if you can't get it because that's a really clever one, but we've only got time to do the quick one now. And that's the billiard ball one. So suppose um, you are, uh, and again, this is entirely down to Wikipedia. Thank you very much, Wikipedia. Suppose, um, I was colorblind and I couldn't tell the difference between red and blue or red and green, sorry, um, more common. And uh, you were saying, no, there is a different color. There's two different colors there. There's a red color and a green color. And I'm going, no, I don't think really there is. And you'd say, look, and you have two billy balls and you'd say, one of these is red and one of these is green. And I go, no, I think they're both the same. Here's the question. Can you convince me that one is red and one is green? Can you convince me that they're different colors? without leaking any other information. In particular, I shouldn't be able to learn out which one's red and which one's green. 
but you should be able to convince me that they are different colors. If you can do that, you've carried out a zero knowledge protocol. And here's the way they suggest you do it. The colorblind person, me, holds up the two billiard balls, one in the left hand and one in the right hand, and you look at them. Then I put them behind my back and I either jumble them around or I pretend to jumble around and keep them in the same hands. So I know if I've swapped them, but you don't. And then I pick them up again and hold them up. And you say, you swapped them or you didn't swap them. Now, if they really are different colors and you can see that, then you'll know straight away and you'll get it right. But there's a chance you could be tricking me. Maybe they are the same color. There's no such thing as green. And you just guess lucky. Maybe you said the right one and I go, damn. And maybe you say, sorry, uh, you didn't swap and I didn't swap. And I go, damn, you got it right. But then I do it again and I do it again and I do it again. And the chance of you getting it right each time halves. You got a 50-50 chance of getting it right each time. So in the long run, um, if we did it a hundred times and you got it right every time, eventually I think, damn, he does know that they're different. He does know one's green and one's red and he knows which one it is, but I don't. I still haven't learned that out, but I'm convinced that you know. Does that make sense? That's a perfect example of a zero knowledge protocol. It's quite beautiful. Think about them. Uh, look at the Hamiltonian cycle one and the challenge one is always try and work out how you could convince someone that you know how to solve a Sudoku puzzle. You have the, uh, 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 the solution of a given Sudoku puzzle. Convince me you have the solution without giving me any clues at all about what the solution is. If you can do that, well, then you've understood zero knowledge protocols. So can everyone try that? Now, um, and there's a little extract I put in from Wikipedia. Uh, I, we're almost out of time and I wanted to say, well, we are out of time. Two things. One is uh, I wanted to say something very briefly about the, um, the something awesome that you're all working on and the um, uh, job application. And I also wanted to talk about the film we're going to watch tonight and the film we're going to watch next week. So tonight we're watching the Enron film. If you want to watch it, it's on a free website. The wonderful one that someone showed us. I can't remember who it was last time that anyone can log into with UNSW credentials and has millions of movies on it. I've given a link to it on the course page on the schedule. You just click there, log in with the UNSW credentials. You get to see every movie ever invented. Uh, in particular, go and look for the Enron film. I've given you a direct link to the Enron film, or you can Google, you can look it up once you're in there. It's got a search bar and it's called Enron, the smartest guys in the room. And we will start that at a given time. And we'll do what we did last time, which is have keep the, um, the Zoom meeting open. They'll probably shut it and reopen it. So we split the recordings in half. Just go back to the same invitation and go to the same Zoom meeting. We'll leave it open if you want to hang around and watch it. And we'll all just watch it. And I'll do a loud call out, three, two, one, cut. And we all start. Uh, and next week, the movie we're doing is The China Syndrome. Now, uh, The China Syndrome is going to be the film that the exam has a question on. So everyone should watch that film, either after the lecture next week, if you can, or in your own time. Um, but everyone should try and find that film. Uh, oh, no, I've got a link to, you can find the film. Oh, I can't remember if it was a free one. You might have to pay a couple of bucks to watch it. Anyway, that's the can film. Can you say that again? Sorry. Sacrilege. The China Syndrome, it's called. It's, it's listed in the course schedule. So that's, we, that's in the, there's a question on that in the exam. Yeah, yeah. Every year, there's, I give you a scenario question. It's a bit like your tutorial. Um, and you know, in the tutorials, you need to know all this background. I give you the background and you have to read it and understand the scenario, then ask you a question. In the exam, you don't want to read a whole lot of background. It's too stressful and everyone gets flustered. So I like telling you the background in advance and you can learn all the background to the scenario in advance. Then when you go into the exam, you can just do an analysis question on it. So the background we normally try and pick is just a film. So if you watch that film and you can look at the past, I'm sure I've given you some past exams, look at the past exams and you'll see how they've done with it in a film. It'll say, the scenario question, this scenario question relates to the events as depicted in the film, blah, 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 die hard. I think we did one year. And then the question is something like, uh, towards the end of the film, the police sergeant comes up to um, Thingo and says, uh, I can't help you right now. I've got to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, and then the actual exam question is, what should the police sergeant have been doing at that time? Uh, talk about the strengths and weaknesses of what he said he was going to do and suggest a better course of action with reasons that he could have done. So in other words, it's given some scenario, what's the right, with your, viewing it with your security eyes, what's the right thing to do? What's the right solution? But instead of me having to write a long page saying, hmm, suppose this has happened and suppose this has happened and suppose this has happened, what would you do? Uh, you get to do that. Does that all make sense? Yeah, thanks. That's good. Make sure I watch it. <laughs>
pretty close to the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you should definitely watch it. Oh, well, it's not going to be a question about what was the name of this character or what, you know, it's, it's not testing your memory about the film. It's testing your, the way you think about the things that happened in the film. Yep. There's nothing like, uh, you know, what, who was the third man shot by the German agent or something weird like that. It's more like if you were the German agent and the FBI had come 10 minutes earlier, um, you know, what things could you have done to prevent X, Y, and Z from happening? That sort of thing. Um, so that's the film. So we'll be starting the film in a, in a minute or two. Uh, and this week is Enron, The Smartest Guys in the Room, and a fantastic film, a documentary. But I just wanted to say something about the job application and the um, something awesome. So the there's just been a bit of stress with people being stressed about it. So I just wanted to basically just reassure and relax everyone. We're not looking for you to do a whole lot of work now. The idea of the job application is we, we want you just to tell us the work you've been doing up until now. We don't want you to do new things. The job application is you just talking about what you have done. And you don't even have to tell us everything. Just tell us some of the best bits. So we've divided into four categories to give you some structure so you know how to give an answer and how to describe what you're doing. Um, and they're the categories that we've talked about from the beginning of the course. But just say what you've done for each of the categories, the things you're most proud of. I have written a really long document, which is probably quite stressful to read because it's so long, uh, in which I suggest things you could use to give evidence for those four criteria. But do other things if you want. It doesn't matter. Just talk about what you've done. If you've got good technical skills as a result of this course, then spend up to a page telling us that you've got good technical skills and what, and what they are. And give evidence for everything you say. And the evidence could be a link to a project you've done or pictures or a blog on something or whatever it is. It's just things you've already done in the course. You don't have to do anything now. Oh, I did this in this week. I did that in that week. I, for the, I don't know, I'm really persistent. I managed to stuck, stick all the jigsaw pieces together of uh, the shredded document. And that, you know, and that also shows my spirit of, you know, stretching myself and working extra hard or whatever. So that's the idea. Don't go and do a whole lot of new stuff now just write up the stuff you've already done. And when you write it up, make the write up really short. And we don't care about the quality of the write up. Some people are thinking, oh, it has to be like an essay or it has to be a really hard thing to write. No, it could be just bullet points. You could write it in doggerel. You can have bad spelling in it. I don't care about any of that stuff at all. Just write it so that someone reading it can work out what you've done, which I reckon makes it means make it short. Just say, I did this. This is good for this reason. Click on this link to see... Um, the comment I got from my tutor, which demonstrates that I did it and that it was really good. There you go. Boom. There's one thing done. So um, just hand in those four pages. Uh, now someone's asked if they can have an extension. We can extend it for longer if you want. I don't know that I'm giving you a favor by extending it, but someone's asked if it could be in, instead of at the week of no, end of week nine, maybe it could be into week 10. So we thought maybe what about the Tuesday of week 10, which is I think 15 days after um, we, we released the document. Um, but I think that's because people are thinking, oh, they have to do a whole lot of work in 15 days to make the document. But actually the document should just take an hour or two, a couple of hours to make. Uh, it, it shouldn't be something that needs 15 days. But if you want, you could hand it in up till the end of the Tuesday in week 10. That's fine. But if you still want to get it in in week nine up till the end of week nine, the Sunday in week nine, that's fine too. And I guess that's sort of impressive for time management. So that could be more evidence you put in the time management thing that I managed to get this done by that. But if you want to, absolutely fine without penalty, you can hand it in up till the Tuesday in week 10. Beyond that, it becomes a bit of a problem because your tutors have to read it and mark it and, and they've got exams and things too. Um, and just read all the instructions about how they're going to mark it. Uh, they just want it, basically the instructions are they want it simple and clear and supported by evidence and not beautiful. Don't, if you find yourself right, spending hundreds of hours writing it, you're doing it wrong. Uh, and your tutors this week will go over and brainstorm with you the sorts of things you can put in and ask any, answer any questions you've got about it and just give you help if you're stressed. But please don't be stressed about it. It's just a little thing. And we're marking it essentially pass fail. So, you know, you just got to get the minimum acceptable level and you're going to get the pass. There are some honor grades for people who've done amazing things if you've done something amazing. Uh, but, you know, don't worry about that if you're feeling stressed. Just do a pass level. You'll be fine. Everything, everyone will be fine. It should be hopefully the easiest assessment you've ever done um, because it's just talking about stuff you've already done in the course. Um, and then there's something awesome project I wanted to say. Uh, uh, people are up stressed about making a video. So we just need the video because if the presentation you're doing live fails or goes wrong or there's a technology problem or something like that, um, then that's a disaster. We, we don't know how to mark it or do it because we're just going to mark it 
in your presentation. They're going to be reading the one page summary you wrote about your um, project and they'll be watching you give the presentation and then they'll just mark it then. So um, what we want you to do is before you give it and before the, the um, before the first shoot gives it so it's fair, so everyone does it at the same time, can you just step into a Zoom room and just give your presentation? Just talk for two minutes about what you've done, what you're proud of, your project, the main things you think you've achieved, whatever your presentation is. Just walk in, click done, you've got a recording, it's simple. It doesn't have to be beautiful, no one cares about presentation. No one cares about what clothes you're wearing, no one cares about anything like that. And then you've got this backup. And if your talk goes brilliantly well when you present in class, in front of the whole class, well then no one will need the backup and it'll be fine. Um, but do do the presentation in front of the class if you can. Some people are saying, can they just play their recording in front of the class? Well, I guess you could, but it's the best part of the whole course when everyone one by ones in their very friendly tutorials just stands up and talks about what they've done. And people ask some questions and chat about it and laugh and it's just really impressive. So, um, you know, please don't be stressed about any of that. And if you are stressed, ask me questions. I've started an FAQ and asked your tutor for questions and ask for help from anyone. But if, if you're doing it in a way that's making you stressed, you're doing it wrong. It's not what we're looking for. It should just be uh, Richard. Yeah, Mickey. You said before the first shoot goes, is that next week or week after? So the video presentations in week nine. So if something goes wrong, we can still run them in week 10. So your video, so you have to have, you have something awesome finished by, I think it was, we wanted it finished by the start of week nine. So, but you can actually have till a few days into week nine. We don't need it till just before the worst first presentation. So right. finish it like this weekend or something or, or now, if you've already finished it and then just do a little sample presentation on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. It just only has to go for two minutes. And okay. if your final one's fine, then... And for technical projects, um, should we do screen capture? Oh, yeah. I strongly recommend... I mean, you do whatever you want. Um, just think, if you're showing off what you've done, how can you show it off best? If you're really proud that it works, then show it working. If you're really proud of the code, then show the code. You know, whatever it is about it that's awesome, show us that because everyone wants to see that. And mm -hmm. you know, in a technical presentation, they never work and things always go wrong. So if it was me, I would definitely pre-record the technical presentation, like screen grabs. And things. So when I'm giving the live presentation, I just show pictures of the screen grabs. I don't actually have to do it live. Or if I do it live, I've got the screen grabs in case it fails because it, you know, half the time in the universe it will fail. Okay. That was good. Uh, and I'll handle questions about it too at the very end. Um, so I think what we'll do is we're now at 10 minutes past seven. So if ever anyone that wants to watch this incredible film, the Enron film, which you should all watch at some stage or other, um, because it's a damn interesting film and weirdly following the Corona crisis in some ways. Um, if you're going to watch it, go to the schedule now and click on the links there and log into that site and get all ready to go. And probably at 7.16 in five minutes time, we'll, we'll try, I'll call out shout. So leave the start. So leave, um, stay logged into this room. Oh, actually, I will log out of this room and then I'll log back in. So at about quarter past, log back into the room um, using the same link and you'll hear me shout go and we'll all, all do it together and watch it together and we'll chat together while it's happening. And if you're not going to come, that's fine. And then we'll use the remaining time while people are doing that. If anyone wants to just ask me quick questions now, rather than typing them into open learning, we can talk about the, the something or some more, the, um, or the uh, portfolio. Excuse me. Sorry. Brain turning into porridge late at night. So go, go. Goodbye, everyone. I very, it was very nice to see you all. I'm really glad we all got to see Brendan. Hang around and ask questions if you want. You can ask me questions other times too. This isn't your only chance, but let's make use of this 10 minutes now or five minutes. And everyone go and start clicking on those links and loading up the Enron film. Okay. Bye. See you. Bye, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Richard. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Thanks Richard. Richard. See you, everyone. Bye, Richard. See you, Neil. Neil. Adam, hello. So, yeah, ask questions. Shoot. I had a question about the job application. Yeah, Andrew, go. Um, so, towards the beginning of the term, um, there was a part of the open learning page where there were some exemplars from previous years. Yeah. Um, but I think they like they somehow disappeared over the course of the term. So it's probably me. We, up. Do you want to see the past one so you can sort of copy the format? They were good. Uh, yeah, if we could just um yeah have like an example of like kind I'm of what past past students have done. I deleted those or got rid of them somehow, didn't I? Do you still have them, Lachlan? 
Yeah, I'll have them sitting around somewhere. I'll have them sitting around somewhere. I know one was Ash Thomas, and I'll be able to remember the other two or three. All right. Even just one would be fantastic. If you could um, uh, edit, or you can just mail it to me if you want, and I'll edit it into the page, or you can edit it into the page as well. Maybe we should put it in the FAQ now because everyone's looking at the FAQ. I think so. I think that's a good spot for it. So rather than fiddling around with the core documents so people don't have to keep rereading it, let's put all the new stuff in the FAQ. Cool. Fantastic. Thank you. So we'll post that, uh, Andrew, um, either tonight, if we find it tonight, or tomorrow morning. Uh, and I get up very early in the morning time. So. All right. Sounds good. Thanks. It's really helpful for everyone that you ask that. Um, I just have a question about uh, the hard exam, like proving that you had an easy exam. Yeah, yeah. Um, so with the method that you were explaining with the 20 questions that were easy and hard and picking at random, um, how I saw it was that, that that just shows, that just shares with them, the only information you're sharing is the difficulty of the exam. Yes. It's, okay. So it's not, it's not proving that it's easy. Oh no, that's right. Yeah. I was, I was really trying to, that's exactly right. Yeah. Thank you. That's why, I mean, it's not a well defined, formally defined problem. Concepts like easy and hard and things are all wishy-washy. That's why I didn't want to say it really was a zero knowledge protocol. It's a wishy-washy protocol, but it has some of the ideas in it, which is I wanted you to have a feel for what the exam was like without giving you the exam. So I thought, why not just give you the things that could have been in the exam? Yeah. Good point, Kev. That's really good. You understand it perfectly. Are there any more? I reckon we've still got 60 seconds. For anyone that's still here, uh, it hasn't been announced yet, but Adam Tanan is going to be doing a rootkits Q&A tomorrow. At Adam, back me up on this 4 o'clock. He is not listening? Cool. I think it's 4 o'clock tomorrow. We'll announce the Zoom link. Thank you. Uh, I forgot to announce that because Brendan's thing went on so long because it was so good. Uh, yeah, it was good. I didn't want to cut it short. Yeah, that's my fault. I'm sorry. Let's do an announcement out to everyone tomorrow morning so they know because be, hearing Adam speak is quite remarkable. Has, has there been any more progress on what the exam is going to look like? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it'll look like last year's exam. Right. Yeah. It'll, so it'll be the same thing, but in terms of distribution and those sorts of things. Oh, yeah. Um, you, is it stressful to tell you that now? Why don't, I, why don't we wait till... I just don't want to overload everyone with a whole lot of stress and talking about assessments, but is it more stressful to not know? Uh, I, I'm... I, I think making that information available would be nice just so, especially like I think ours is on a Saturday, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, is it? I think so. Am I wrong about that? Yeah. That's currently where it's scheduled. Half yeah. Exam period now has to be at the front. It's very annoying. I think you're like the, you're like the first Saturday, which is like day nine of the exam period or something. Nine. But realistically, like, yeah, I think, I think that's probably close to the earliest they would put anyway. Well, um, we can only, it takes us eight days to mark. So this is a problem we had last year. So if they put us more than eight days, closer than eight days to when the marks are due, then yeah. Marks in time. At least for everyone. Yeah. Um, um, so yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. I can release that. I can release that. I'm happy to tell. I, you don't think it's stressful to talk about all that stuff? I, I, I'm one of those people who thinks it's, it's, it's less stressful to know. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I don't. I know that there are some people who aren't like that. But at least because, like, because there's been so much uncertainty. I'll set up an exam page. How about that? And, I'll, and we can have an FAQ on it, so people can ask questions, and we'll start adding info there. And it can be our central go-to page for the final exam. And then every nice if you can that. that's a central repository for knowledge. Yeah. All right. I'll do that, and I can set that up tomorrow and tell people how it's going to work. It, it, it's not hard or mysterious or secret. Yeah. It's yeah. That's the thing. Okay. Good. I think I might. Do we have any seconds left, or is it like we can if you need Lauren? Um, I keep saying Lauren, with the <laughs> but it just the whole name splattered out there. Yeah, it became a bit of a meme last last lecture. So someone made this for me, and I thought I may as well use it. Awesome. <laughs> um, with the lightning talks. Um, or oh, one thing is is the tutor that's marking us the same as our tutor, or is it an independent tutor? Because yeah. that will actually depend how I format everything. That will. That's a debate we keep having. Uh, um, I, Lachlan, is he still here? Did, what did we end up deciding? So, sorry, you're talking about specifically something awesome, were you, Laura? And the job app. Okay. Especially the job app. Because if I say, like, oh, I've done 
you know, I've participated really well in every single shoot. It's not like I have any evidence to say that I actively had my camera on and actively participated. So I think at the moment it's likely that it will be your tutor marking it, oh, that's but there can't be that guarantee. So what I've offered to do for my class mm-hmm. is that they email me now and say, hey, can you just confirm that I've been participating? I'm responding going, yep, yeah, no, you've been awesome. You've been a core member. Perfect. Do that. Yeah. Just gather. Okay. That's, that's good. Even if it is your own tutor marking, it's good to have the evidence because if there's a challenge and things have to be remarked for some reason, so the academic board says, we just want to check the marking standards of your course. They go, hey, this person, Laura, got a high mark and she didn't have any evidence. You know, is that some sort of corruption going on? So I reckon just any claims you want evidence for, now start seeking out the people that can give you evidence and ask them just to confirm. It doesn't have to be anything. But Lachlan's idea is perfect. What do you think? Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Um, on that note as well, I gave a lightning talk uh, like really early on in the term um, and I actually haven't been able to access my talk. It was filmed by my tutor and I haven't been able to like get that. Is there like somewhere they're uploaded that I can find that? Because I'll probably need to link to that as evidence. Yeah, definitely. And also, are we still getting, um, are they being watched? Are we getting extra marks for doing that anymore or not? Yeah, if you've done a lightning talk and I find out about it and someone puts it in the Hall of Fame, you get the extra mark. So I'll, I'll jump in here and admit that I haven't been updating the Hall of Fame. I have been keeping all of these videos, getting them from the tutors, putting them all together. So I have them all. I just haven't been uploading them. Yes, you'll get the marks, but yes, I need to upload them. Well, let's upload them and put people in the Hall of Fame. That's a great yeah, thing. It's definitely. People do that. Uh, and uh, Laura, I'm just seeing other ways you can get evidence is um, you could just write to the other people in your tutor and say, hey, remember I did this thing in week one. What did you guys think of it? And that's evidence. They could say, yeah. Or you could write to your tutor saying, um, hey, I still haven't seen the video. What happened to it or something? And then you say, oh, I did this lightning talk. Here's a link to the ev- tutor where we talk about it. Unfortunately, it hasn't been posted. So yeah, you can generate evidence that way. Yeah, I can told you... people in my class to blog about it and then I'll go and comment saying, like, oh yeah, I can confirm that they contributed this to the yeah, tutorial. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or even not even making it sound like a sort of legalistic confirmation. Just say, yeah, I, I agree with this. I, lo- you know, I really loved what you did. I thought it was one of the best talks I've seen for a long time. Can you, on recording, just like list off all the people who've contributed in the lectures so we can just cite that you've said that we con- contributed? <laughs> the best contributor's been Lauren, but I, I can't find her on the roll. <laughs> we don't have anyone of that name. It's really weird. Um, i better go, though, because everyone's waiting in the movie yeah. thing. But I keep asking these questions. They're great. Exam questions you can ask on the exam page. The other question you can ask on the other page or send me mails or anything. I'm ha- very happy to talk. Um, and, and hopefully, if there's anything that's stressing you, we can fix it all up because there shouldn't be anything stressful at this stage. We now should be approaching the nice part of the course where you look back over what you've done and you're feeling quite good. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah.